Good morning. I'm Brenda Husson, the rector at St. James Church, and it is my privilege to be able to welcome you all here to this celebration of the Holy Eucharist on this, the last Sunday after Epiphany. It's, of course, also Valentine's Day and a good day for us to remember the great truth that God loves us. So we're very glad that you're here, whether you are a regular part of our congregation or whether you are joining us for the first time. And wherever you are, we are delighted that you have chosen to spend this time with us. A few things that I do want to announce today. One is that tomorrow, being the day we celebrate President's Day, the parish house will be closed and the staff will be off tomorrow. But plenty going on this week. Of course, it is Ash Wednesday, this Wednesday, and we will have an online service at six o'clock, streaming from right here at St. James, so please join us for that. There is also a four o'clock service in the park for families and children. So if you'd like to know more about that, you can be in touch with any of the clergy or with Vicki Hall. But those things are happening, and of course, Shrove Tuesday is Tuesday before Ash Wednesday, and we won't be able to have our usual celebrations. So I hope that you will enjoy pancakes or whatever else it is that you like to do on Shrove Tuesday at home. Also, we are beginning our course Sacred Ground this coming Wednesday. That will be the first session. That class looks at race and faith and issues of racial reconciliation. It comes to us through our presiding bishop's office. And if you would like to take part, please let Jay Sidebotham know that so that he can make sure that you get the materials ahead of time. It is a 10-week class and we expect regular participation, though you don't need to make that commitment until after the first two. But there is a fair amount of reading and videos to watch, so we wanna make sure you have what you need if you'd like to join us. But again, most of all, welcome. We are so glad that you are worshiping with us. Let us pray. O oh God, who wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature, grant that we may share the divine life of him who humbled himself to share our humanity, your Son, Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, who before the passion of your only begotten Son revealed his glory upon the holy mountain, grant to us that we, beholding by faith the light of his countenance, may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness from glory to glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. The Lord, the God of gods, has spoken. He has called the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, perfect in its beauty, God reveals himself in glory. Our God will come and will not keep silence. Before him there is a consuming flame and round about him a raging storm. He calls the heavens and the earth from above to witness the judgment of his people. Gather before me my loyal followers, those who have made a covenant with me and sealed it with sacrifice. Let the heavens declare the rightness of his cause, for God himself is judge. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. 
Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. There are some to whom our gospel is veiled, St. Paul tells us. There are some to whom our gospel is veiled. Several years ago, when I was in the process of returning to church after a season of falling away, I went on a retreat with some of the other young adults from the new parish I was attending. It was a way for me to gently dip my toe back into the waters of faith. The day started off fine enough. In fact, there were moments that were perfectly lovely. There were small conversations that were gathered around coffee and tea. There were gentle walks that were taken outside in nature, in the beauty of the retreat center. And the day was dotted with silence, time spent in prayer in the chapel where we were. Everything was going just fine. Everything was going just fine until, until we were gathered back together as a group to learn a new prayer practice at least one that was going to be new to me. Latin for divine seeing, visio divina, is what we were about to learn. But basically, it's just a way of praying in which you use images or famous works of art as a way to enter into scripture as opposed to just simply reading it. As we all filed back into the room of the retreat center where we gathered, soon our visual aid was introduced to us. We were going to be spending some time with Rembrandt's famous painting, The Return of the Prodigal Son. If you've never seen it before, the oil on canvas is a breathtaking depiction. In the scene, we see a son who was once thought dead, hairless and tattered, kneeling before his father, who is angled lovingly towards him. The encounter is a symbol of the grace that is soon to come. It's a symbol of love amidst the wretchedness and the mistakes of the past. It's a story that's carried from beginning to end by a love without conditions. As our image drew us into our time of prayer, other people in the room began to remark on things that they noticed in the painting. Some commented on the interplay of lightness and darkness in the painting, noting who was in the foreground, who was in the background, who was in the shadows and why. Other people decided to zero in on details in the subjects, trying to discern what any of these could teach us about the story we were looking at. Basically, everyone was being drawn into the story, everyone except for me. You see, what I didn't mention is that I have a little bit of a history with this parable. The idea that despite our mistakes, despite all the things that we've done wrong in the past, the idea that no matter how much we mess up, that God will always want to be in relationship with us with a reckless abandon is something that just seemed too strange and foreign to me. It seemed too strange and foreign about what I thought I knew about God and certainly about many of the relationships in this world. Anyways, beyond that time of prayer, we eventually found ourselves back in the chapel of the retreat center. And as we were in the chapel, our retreat leader and celebrant for the day began to point out different things that he wanted us to notice. 
And so we eventually got to the table that we were all gathered around, and he asked us if we noticed anything weird, anything strange or unusual about it. Eyes searching the outside of the piece, they eventually landed on a big crack on the side of the altar, which was shaped like a chalice, shaped like a vessel or a cup. And what he then told us was that that crack was not a consequence of wear and tear, was not a consequence of age and time. The artist who was commissioned to make the chalice-shaped altar had just about finished it, but took one final glance and said, you know what? It's just too perfect. And so with intention, the artist carved that crack into the side of the altar. He wanted it to be a symbol that perfection is not a prerequisite to receive. He wanted everyone to know that it was not, um, he wanted everyone to know that you were invited, not in spite of your misgivings and failures, but because of them. As you can imagine, I then began to have an emotional response to this table and to the information that came with it. And all of the weight about my own mistakes and my own failures that I'd been carrying that morning and many mornings before that morning began to feel lighter. They began to slip away. In short, it felt like the first time in a long time that the gospel didn't feel so veiled to me. It felt like a moment when I was finally meeting Jesus face to face. I tell that story. I tell that story because I think it has a powerful connection with our gospel passage for today. In our gospel for today, we hear an account of an incredible scene, a scene that also has something to say about imperfect people, if you look for it. Six days after saying that some of his followers would experience the kingdom of God in a very real and present way, Jesus delivers on this promise. He takes Peter, James, and John up to a high mountain, and what happens is truly incredible. Jesus' appearance changes. He shimmers, he sparkles, he dazzles white. And he begins to be in a deep conversation with both Moses and Elijah, which is pretty incredible since they were both long dead. And then more incredible still, we are told that a voice comes out of the sky and points to Jesus and says, this is my beloved. Won't you listen to him? But the thing that I find incredible about this moment is not all of the wonder and the dazzling and the conversations with dead people. The thing that I find incredible about it is who was invited to see it, Peter, James, and John. In short, what happens in this scene is a great unveiling where the awesome reality of the gospel is made known and eventually spread not through perfect people, but through three disciples whose failures, flaws, and misgivings are well documented. People who knew what it meant to make a mess of things, and yet would soon be conduits for the glory of God. And when I hold this story together with my story and with your story, and with every story in the scriptures, what I sense is that the golden strand that unites them, the common truth in all, is that we follow a God who knows the lines and color, every detail of each story of brokenness, and yet invites us into relationship, not in spite of our misgivings and failures, but because of them. Beloved in Christ, if this gospel, if this God feels veiled to you, let one thing be certain, and that is the unshakable truth that Jesus is calling to you in relationship. And perfection is not a prerequisite to receive. Because if perfection was necessary, then he would have never called Peter, a man who denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. And if perfection was what was really needed, then he wouldn't have called James and John, because they once lusted after the wrong kind of glory. And if perfection was truly what was needed to follow, to be in relationship with God, then he definitely, definitely wouldn't have called Paul a persecutor of Christians who God transfigured into an evangelist for the gospel and a martyr for the faith. Beloved, if the demons, 
and the haunts of your past life, of your misgivings and failures, make you feel like you are beyond repair. Know that every story of every saint and every character in Scripture has found people that God was able to work through, rough edges included. And so surely, surely this God, this awesome, magnificent, all-powerful, all-loving, transfiguring God, if he can work with their rough edges, then surely he can work with yours too. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Holy God, you call your church to share the good news of your love. We pray for the wider Christian witness and ask that you inspire us to do the work you have called us to do. Create in us generous hearts and willing spirits. Lord, in your mercy. Holy God, you call the nations to yourself. Open our eyes to see the goodness and respect the dignity of every human being. We pray for Joseph, our president, the Congress, the courts, and all who hold authority in the nations of the world. May we recognize that your love has no boundary or limitation. Lord, in your mercy. Holy God, you call us to care for your creation. Open our eyes to the beauty of our world so that we might better care for our planet and for one another. Lord, in your mercy. Holy God, you search us out and know us. Comfort and heal the sick and sorrowful especially those who are on the front lines of this COVID-19 pandemic, that they may know that they are not alone. Keep them in your care and help us tend to one another. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Holy God, if you climb up to heaven, you are there. When we make the grave our bed, you are there also. We remember those who have died, especially Danielle Henderson. Hold the dead in your loving care forevermore and comfort the living with hope eternal. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Holy God, you call your saints in every age to proclaim your gospel and to enact your grace. We give you thanks for saints like James, our patron, and ask that you give us wisdom to answer your call and strength to do your will. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us offer each other a sign of Christ's peace. And at this time, I would like to invite our senior warden, Jennifer Charrington, to come forward and give us an update on our common life as it relates to stewardship. Jennifer. Good morning. As the parish's elected lay leaders, St. James Vestry members are charged with supporting our spiritual and financial health and growth. As many of you know, over the past several years, we have consciously made a shift in how we think and talk about stewardship here at St. James. Having meaningful discussions about how we are being called to give from a spiritual place and prayerfully answering the question of, what percentage of my income is God calling me to give, has allowed us to exceed our stewardship goal for 2020. This is a very big deal and worth celebrating, so I offer a huge thank you. Looking ahead, many of you have already made a financial commitment for 2021. As of Friday, 314 households have pledged 87% of our 2021 stewardship goal. Again, thank you. Your commitment to St. James is essential to the work we share as a beloved community building the kingdom of God. If you have not yet made your 2021 commitment, please know that your doing so now at the beginning of the year is a great gift. We want the entire parish to be all in as we build on the incredible momentum of 2020. You can make a 2021 financial commitment online or by contacting Sandra de la Cruz. Few things would bring me more joy than to be able to stand before you without a mask on, gathered here together in our church in a year's time to say that we met or exceeded our stewardship goal for 2021. For each time that we do, we move towards fully sustaining our ministries, our facilities, and our life together in Christ. I invite you to join in. I would be remiss if I did not mention the fact that as much as St. James depends upon our financial gifts, we also depend upon each other's spiritual gifts. In a year like no other, we have worshiped remotely, figured out how to serve the least served in different ways, and lifted each other up, 
all in Christ's name. Each one of you is a blessing. For all that you do and all that you are, I offer my grateful thanks. Thank you, Jennifer, and we're grateful for your leadership. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us in offering and sacrifice to God.
We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with the blessed Virgin Mary, blessed James, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
gifts of God for the people of God. Let us pray. In union, dear Lord, with the faithful at every altar of your church, where your blessed body and blood are being offered to the Father, I desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving. I present to you my soul and body with the earnest wish that I may ever be united to you. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I pray you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you and embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Oh, let nothing ever separate me from you. Let me live and die in your love. Amen.
us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Christ, the Son of God, be manifest in you, that your lives may be a light to the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God. Thank mm-hmm. you.